We're going to turn to John chapter 4 uh, this morning. We're going to continue in our series, According to John. We're working verse by verse through this entire gospel together. And this morning I want to start in verse 27 down through verse 42. Of course, we're continuing with the encounter that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, we've gone through a number of different uh, aspects of it with the encounter. But then in verse 27, he's, it's kind of the end of the situation. And it says in verse 27, his disciples now had come back from getting meat for Jesus. It says, upon this came his disciples talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city, and they came unto him. And in the mean, while his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves. And know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. We'll leave the reading at that this morning and look at a message that I've titled, Consumed with Christ. Consumed with Christ. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll, uh, we'll unpack this together. Lord, I just thank you once again for each one that's here this morning, for ears that are willing to hear your truth. And I pray that it might be uh, proclaimed this morning accurately and with application. And Lord, may you just bless these moments together as we study your word we ask that your spirit would be at work within us, convicting us and moving us and uh, changing us and making us more into your image. We thank you for that opportunity now, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, of course, um, I'm not going to repeat the whole story, but you've got to understand the context where we picked up this morning. And of course, we're dealing with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Jesus was on a journey uh, up to the north of Galilee on through this region of Samaria. This was a region that most Jews would have avoided because the Samaritans were, were not in, uh, in, in great uh, union with the Jews at this point. In fact, the Jews despised the Samaritans for how they uh, had felt they had corrupted the uh, truth that the Jews had been given. And so there was, uh, there was this, um, so there was this encounter that happened in the middle of the day with a woman who was coming to a well, Jacob's well, there in the middle of Samaria. And of course, Jesus asked her for water, and he tells her about the living water that he has for her. And in the course of it all, the woman eventually realizes Jesus Christ is not like everybody else. <laughs> there's something different here, and there's something that I need in my life that he's offering. And we don't know at what point in time, but at some point in time, the woman obviously places her faith and her trust in Jesus Christ. And it is just about at this point where we pick up the story uh, at, 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 in verse 27. So we have this story, and it's just like many of stories in Scripture, where we see people whose life was headed in the wrong direction. Wasn't that the truth of this woman? We know only little bits and pieces of her story, but she had five husbands. She was coming in the middle of the day, 
and uh, she was coming because, you know, she was not able or welcome to come at other times when the, the normal people would gather water. Uh, she had been ostracized from society, and she was part of a culture, a Samaritan culture, that the Jews would have said, you have no right to be a part of the truth of what God has. Uh, these, were, these were people as a people group that were ostracized by the Jews. Her life was headed in all of the wrong directions, and just one encounter with Christ, everything changed. Her life turned around and began to head in the right way. And so this, this section of Scripture really talks about what her life and what our lives will look like when we truly have that encounter. Christ, what is it going to do in us? How is it going to change us? How is it going to consume our resources, our thoughts, our time, and, and what we have to give uh, in the life that we've been given? And, you know, I think this especially applies as we look this morning to Graduate Recognition Sunday. You know, this is a big achievement. You've gone through all these years of education, and now it's almost like a point of demarcation as you head out of high school, and now you head out into your own. You, you, your life all of a sudden becomes your own. You're not under this, uh, this hand of, I'm, I'm still growing up. You're, you're making this transition now as a graduate into what am I going to do with my life? What, my, what are my plans going to be? What are my goals? What am I going to aspire to? How am I going to spend the time and the resources and the talents that I've been given in life? It's a life, really, it's a, it's a critical moment because we begin to make those decisions and we begin to put ourselves on paths that either will serve the Lord or are going to take us further away from the Lord. So I want us to challenge not just the graduates, but each of us. You say, well, that's for me. I don't even remember my high school graduation. Well, that's okay. It's never too late to have your life changed for Christ and consumed with Christ. It's never too late to change course. This lady probably thought all of her answers were in the past too. She probably thought her, her, her situation was hopeless. She probably thought there's nothing that could change all the mess that she had made with, with the husbands and the life that she had been living. But you know what? Christ assured her, yes, you can. You can change and you can be changed and then you can be consumed with what it means to truly live for me. We're going to look at just some, some of the attitudes and actions that came out of this encounter of a woman that all of a sudden was changed and then consumed with living her life for Christ. We see it first in verse 27. It's, not even, it's before the lady even is involved in the, in the, the, the dialogue, but... You know, the disciples had gone. Jesus was left there by the well. He was tired. He was weary. He was thirsty. He had sent his disciples into town and said, go see if you can find us something to eat. And that's what they had done. And here they were after Jesus had all this time to speak with the woman one-on-one. -on -one. The disciples had just returned with something to eat. And what does it say in verse 27? His disciples came and they marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said... What seeketh thou, or why talkest thou with her? Now, we've already discussed the fact it wasn't, it wasn't seemly, it wasn't accepted, it wasn't socially okay for not just a man to speak in private with a woman in that culture today, but to speak to a Samaritan woman as a Jew would have been a bad thing. And plus, now we have a rabbi. Jesus was considered a rabbi by many. He was a teacher, a teacher of the Jews, speaking with a Samaritan woman in the middle of the day, in the middle of Samaria. There were all things wrong with this. This encounter shouldn't have been taking place. And so when the disciples came back, do you see what the picture here is? Their jaws were dropped. <laughs> You could, you could put it this way. They were speechless. <laughs> they looked at this and they said, Jesus, what are you doing? And this is what was going through their minds. They couldn't even get those words out. It says they marveled that he talked with the woman, but they didn't even know what to say. It was that, you know, unexpected. And I think this is the first point when we begin to allow ourselves to be consumed by Christ, to truly be living for Him, do you know what we begin to find? 
we begin to find that there are a number of unexpected encounters that we will, we will meet with people. Have you ever had that experience where you say, I'm, I'm trying to live for the Lord, and I, I'm trying to do the right thing, and then all of a sudden, some strange person walks up to you, and, and you're like, how did I end up talking to this person? How did I end up, and you get into a dialogue, and the next thing you know, because, you know, the Word of God is flowing from you, you're trying to be a witness, you're trying to be a testimony, what happens? Well, you begin to start talking about Christ. You start talking about the Lord. Hey, do you know, what church do you go to? Hey, do, do you read the Bible? Hey, I was just reading this this morning, and, you know, and you begin this conversation with maybe an encounter with someone that you, you may not have expected to have an encounter with. I had, I've had this numbers of times, uh, and it doesn't happen all the time, but it certainly does happen at, at, at strange times. I had, a, I had an encounter with someone, I think I've explained this to you one point before in the past, but just out of the blue, somebody, uh, an old man drove his, drove his old beat-up pickup truck into my driveway one time. Out of the blue, never met him, never saw his truck before, never met him before, and he came up to me, and I, and I came out, and I said, can I help you? And he says, yeah, he says, he says uh, are you Dave Donnelly? I said, yeah, that's, that's me. He says, well, he says, I heard that maybe you could tell me how, how I could be saved. I mean, this was the first words out of his mouth. I'm like, I don't know you. <laughs> I don't know where you may have even found out where I live. <laughs> but here he was. He was seeking. And you know what? God draws people who need to know the Lord into the paths of those that know the Lord and are consumed by living for the Lord. These, these types of encounters should become normal for us. Do you believe really that all the encounters that we have in life as Christians are just mere coincidence? How many times have you run into people by accident and you begin to talk about something that's consequential and you say, God put that person in front of me. God, God orchestrated this. You know, God orchestrates our encounters in life. Maybe, you know, maybe not every encounter we have, but certainly they're not all coincidence. I'm convinced that God orchestrates those times when we need to meet someone. Do you know Jesus needed to meet this woman of Samaria on this day? This was, this was a need. The woman had a need. Why would Jesus have been going through Samaria in the first place? <laughs> you know, why would he be left there on the well by himself? This is not typical. This was a, an unexpected encounter. And this was the situation, which is why 2 Timothy 4.2 is so important for us as Christians. What does it say? It says, preach the word. Uh, does that mean you're a preacher? Well, if you want to call it that, then yes. <laughs> if you're a Christian, if you know the Lord is your Savior, the Bible says you're a preacher. Preach the word. When are we to preach the word? 2 Timothy 4.2 says, be instant in season and out of season. Do you know why we have to be ready with the word in our heart and on our tongues, even when it's out of season? Because we should expect unexpected encounters with people who need to hear about Christ. People will marvel at our encounters. If we want to be used by God, we're going to have to be ready and available to God. And then these encounters are something that we may see as the norm. What do we see then with the woman? The woman was still there, by the way, when the disciples came in dumbfounded about this whole situation. The woman was still standing there, finishing her conversation with Jesus. And it says in verse 28, it says, Then the woman left her water pot, and she went her way into the city. And she saith, um, and she saith to the men in, in verse 29, which we'll get to, uh, she goes in to talk to the men of the city. I think this is a, the second point that we want to bring up. Someone that's consumed by Christ not only will, will have marvelous and, and people will have unexpected encounters, but all of a sudden our other priorities will become secondary. Our other priorities will become secondary. Why do I say that? Do you see what this woman does? It says, and it's a very important detail, the woman left her water pots. Now, why did the woman come to the well in the heat of the day? She needed water. <laughs> her family needed water. Maybe her, her livestock needed water. 
She had brought all the equipment, we had talked about this, to come draw the well, to carry this water back to the city, to, to meet a, a very basic need. You know, you can't live very long if you aren't drinking water, if you don't have water. And, and she wouldn't have come to the well if it wasn't a necessity that day that her family have water. This was a priority. This was, this was probably number one priority of the day. Make sure we have water. You know, we don't even understand what this is like anymore, do we? <laughs> We turn on the tap and the water's coming and it's fresh and it's clean and it's good. We don't even think about drawing water. But if I'll tell you, if the water gets shut off or you get one of these boil water notices, you know what's the first thing on your mind every day? <laughs> oh, I got to make sure I have enough water. I have enough water to do the dishes. I have enough water to, 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 to you know, to, to make my food for the day. Do I have enough water to do this. And what are we doing? We are making that a priority, right? It's a, it's a critical thing. But what does the lady do? In the midst of talking to Jesus, heat of the day, had her water pots there, she just walks away from them. She leaves her water pots. All of a sudden, what had been a primary concern for hers now became secondary. You know, I think this is a real issue for us, a hard issue for us as Christians. Because we get so caught up into the things of life, the priorities that we begin to set, the primary concerns that we have. Now, they might not be water, but we certainly, we, we, we watch the news, we watch the media, we get involved with the entertainment, and all of a sudden, we get involved with our job, we get involved with our children, we have activities, we have goals are, that we, we begin to set for ourselves. And you know what we're doing? We're setting priorities. And then we say, you know, I, you're right, I, I need to put Christ in there too. He should be in my list. And so we make a top 10 list of our priorities and we put Christ in it. And we feel like as Christians, we're doing the right thing. We feel like, well, he's in the top 10. You know, we're, here we are. You know, we're, we're, we're doing the right. I, I'm going to read my Bible today. These are great things. I mean, these are, these are things that we should have in our life. Don't get me wrong. But the question is, what, how does Christ place in your top 10 list. <laughs> Has he become your priority? Has he become so consuming of your life and of your time and of your attention that these other things all seem secondary? Even the critical things of life. I'm not saying we can't live without, you know, we need water, we need these things. You can't just ignore them. But are those the most important things that you allow your attention and your mind to be focused on? Or have your needs truly become secondary. We see in the life of this Samaritan woman that when she truly was consumed by following Christ, even the very basic need of watering, of having water for her home, became secondary to telling others about the Lord. So other needs will become secondary. Let's look at this, the third point, verses 29 and 30. The woman goes to the city and she says, come, See a man which told me all the things which I ever did. Is not this the Christ? And then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now, the third point that I want to mention for someone that's truly consumed by Christ is that your testimony will draw others to Christ. Your testimony will draw others to Christ. Do you realize, why was this woman out there in the middle of the day again? Let's just refresh this. Because she was ostracized in some way from her society. And yet here she was, this woman of disrepute, going back to the city and speaking to whom? Not the other ladies. No, she spoke to the men of the city. This wasn't a commonly accepted practice even in that day and age. She was going to come back. Here was this woman who was already ostracized from her own friends. She had to come out and draw in the middle of the day. Now she was coming back to the people of the city, speaking to the men, those that were in charge, those that were making decisions for the, the, the respectable families in the city. And what was she telling them? Come see someone who changed my life. Come. Do you realize that when you have a testimony, what you are doing is you are inviting people to come to Christ? Let's be clear. When we ask some, let's, let's not beat around the bush. Hey, I, I, you, you go and you meet someone that needs to know the Lord. What do you need to say? Hey, you need to come to Christ. 
you need to you need to come to church. Will you come with me? Will you come and sit with me in my car or where, wherever you're at? <laughs> Will you come? You know, in, in sales, this is called the ask. You know, a good salesman, they, they, they talk about how you make a sale, right? And they say, you can tell all the good things about the product, and you can go demonstrate the product to someone, but at some point, if you're going to sell the product, you're going to sell that vacuum cleaner, you're going to sell that fuller brush, what are you going to have to do? You have to ask them, will you buy this? <laughs> will you come? Will you accept this? We have to get to the point where we invite people to come to Christ with our testimony. What's the second word she says? Come, see a man. The second part of our testimony confirms something about Jesus Christ. Our testimony confirms the reality that Christ is a living being. <laughs> He's not just some superstition that I made up. He's not just some fable that I read about in the Bible. No, she says, come see him for yourself. He changed my life. He's a real living Savior, just as we, we sung a little bit ago. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, no matter what other men may say. There's lots of people that, oh, yeah, I believe in Christ. Well, what is he? Well, he's a good story, gave us a lot of good ideas, a lot of good teachings. No, he's a living, risen Savior. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God. He ever intercedes for us. He's our advocate. He's the redeemer that we need from our sins. Jesus Christ is a real person. Our testimony should confirm the reality of Christ. And what does it say then? She says, come see a man which told me. You know, your testimony tells others what Christ has done for you. Tells others what Christ has told you about yourself. You know, when we truly understand what the Bible tells us about ourselves, we realize where we stand before God. The Bible says we are lost in our, in, our, in our own sins. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. The Bible says all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. Do you know what? He told us all those things, but then he says, but you know what? The love of Christ is greater. <laughs> Jesus Christ died for your sins. God loves you. When we sing those truths, they're only truths when we realize who we were <laughs> in the face of them. You know, it's all easy and well and good to love someone who does a good thing and is a good person and tries to do their best. God doesn't love us because we try to do our best. God loves us despite the fact that our best is filthy rags. <laughs> God loves us in those areas, and our testimony needs to reflect that. Reflect to someone, you know, God, you know guys, <laughs> I'm, I'm a terrible person. I'm a sinner. I, I'm a, I, I don't have my act together. What did this woman have to say to these men? Hey, uh, hey guess what, guys? I got my act all cleaned up. She didn't have her act cleaned up. She had experienced the love of Christ, the redemption that Christ would offer, the fact that Christ would take her as she is, just like that song, just as I am without one plea, but that Christ would die for me. That's the, that's the fact. That's the reality of what we need to explain to people in our testimony. Well, let's keep moving. Verse, verses 31 to 34. We see that someone's consumed with Christ will have unexpected encounters. Your other needs will become secondary. Your testimony will draw others to Christ. And your work for the Lord will be satisfying to you. Your work for the Lord will satisfy you. This is what the disciples now, they intervene. Verse 31, meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, Master, eat. Jesus had just sent them away for food. He knew he was hungry. They knew he had You know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Has any man brought him to eat? Jesus saith to him, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Was Jesus hungry that day?
He needed water from the well. He needed these physical things to keep him going. But what does the lesson that he's trying to teach his disciples in this? There's something more important than filling my belly. There's a spiritual component. There's a spiritual dimension that will satisfy you in greater ways than a good supper will. He was physically hungry, but just as we had watched this woman at the well had become consumed with following Christ, yet here was his disciples. They were more concerned with having a good lunch together than recognizing what the spiritual needs that were going on right in front of them. Remember, they were just, right, their jaws were dropped. They were flabbergasted at what was going on. And all they could think was, well, I guess it's time for lunch. She left. <laughs> all right, Jesus, she left. Let's have lunch. And Jesus says, you're missing the point, disciples. Do you see a lady here that just got completely consumed with following me? Where's the zeal? <laughs> Do you realize that following me is going to satisfy you more than having a nice lunch together? This is, the, this is the essence of what he's saying. He teaches them and teaches us that following the Lord's work will satisfy us in deeper ways than we're going to find in anything else. Whether it's a meal, whether it's a hobby, whether it's a goal in life, whether it's a priority that we set, whether it's some entertainment that we feel is going to, to fulfill us and meet our needs, you know what? They will all leave us empty. The only thing that will satisfy us is when we are consumed with Jesus Christ. We all know the story of Thomas Edison, right? When you think of Thomas Edison, you think of the light bulb, right? He, he, he made the first commercially viable light bulb. Um, by the way, he didn't invent the light bulb. Someone else invented it. But he made the first one that could be commercially viable. And, of course, he invented a lot of other things, too. He has well over a 1,000 patents to his name. And it says that Thomas Edison, he would average 18 hours a day in his lab and at his desk. 18 hours a day. Now, his lab was only steps away from his home. He would not leave his lab for 18 hours a day. And when he really got into something, his, uh, his other uh, people that would work with him, his other technicians said, he sometimes became so immersed in his work that he would stay in his lab for days, day and night, without sleeping and without eating because he was so obsessed with finding that next invention, with dealing with that next contraption that he was putting together. He was what? He was consumed with inventing, consumed so much that sleep didn't matter to him and eating didn't matter to him. Now, of course, he didn't go for weeks on end. Have you ever gotten so consumed with something that you're doing that you say, oh, I forgot to eat lunch today? <laughs> oh, I got so wrapped up in what I was doing that I just... I just forgot about that, you know, or you get working at night, you're doing something and you're like, hey, it's already midnight. I didn't I should have gone to bed an hour ago or three hours ago. That's someone who's consumed with something. Have we ever been consumed to that extent with Jesus Christ? Have we ever been so consumed and our minds been so saturated with wanting to do the Lord's work that it's like, oh, I got to eat. Oh. I, it's midnight already. Here I was reading my Bible, and I didn't realize it. This is the idea. It should be satisfying to us. It should be more than meat. That's what he's saying. It needs to be more for us. We need to realize it will satisfy us in greater ways. Verse 35, we've got to keep moving. We see urgency in our work. He says, Jesus says to them, Say not ye, there are four months, and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields. They're well ready to harvest. He says, you need to see some urgency, disciples. When you're consumed with me, you'll realize it can't wait till tomorrow. It's got to happen today. The fruit's ready to pick. There's people in front of you that need to know about me. This may be their only encounter with you. Have you ever met folks? Did you say, this may be their only encounter with me? And you say... Oh, well, I'll put it off. Well, I'll talk to him next time. And you know what? There wasn't a next time. Jesus says, the fields are white to harvest today. You know, when the tomato's ripe, you pull it off the plant. You don't say, boy, you know, I've got other thing business today. Now, I don't know if anybody's tomatoes are ripe yet. But the fact of the matter is, when the tomatoes are ripe, what do you say? Oh, 
I'm going to go check tomorrow. Oh, it's getting a little, it's ready. It's almost ready, right? We're out, we're expecting, we're ready to pull it when it's time. We don't say, you know what? Eh, I've got a red tomato out there. I'm busy this week. Let's go next week. We'll leave it on the vine. It'll be fine. I'll pick it there. It'll still be there. And then next week we come and what? <laughs> it's a rotten fruit. <laughs> it's no good. The worst thing is when you get zucchinis like that, right? <laughs> they say, oh, this is a perfect zucchini, I'll, but I'm going to get it tomorrow. And the next day it's a canoe that you could haul out, right? <laughs> that's how they grow. <laughs> we pick fruit when it's ripe. We watch it. We're ready. We're looking for signs. And Jesus says, this is what we need to be doing as Christians. Consume your life with me. Find the urgency in, in knowing this today. See the field that's ripe unto the harvest and be ready to harvest when the time is right. Verse 36. He says that being consumed with Christ is not an individual effort, it's a team effort. He says, He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. He that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Do you know that everything you do in your work for Christ isn't always going to be going to pluck the fruit off the plant? <laughs> we just uh, had some experience with this. We planted a garden this year with my daughter. We put some seeds in the ground. You know what? I don't know when or if we're going to see something from all those things. I will say a couple little plants have started to come up, which we're excited about. But I could also tell you there's some places where we planted seeds and nothing came up at all. That's the part of our work of Christ, too. Sometimes we're going to be planting seeds, and we're going to say, I'm doing my job. I'm out hoeing the field. I'm doing the, doing the right thing. And we're saying, eh, that little plant didn't come up at all. Sometimes that happens. Does that deter us? Does that say, I'm out of the gardening business. <laughs> I, I planted these, and if those seeds didn't come up, I'm never doing a garden again. Well, sometimes that's how we talk about our Christian faith, isn't it? Well, I talked to this person, and he just, you know, told me how I was a hypocrite. He told me how I couldn't tell him, and, you know, all these things. And he, he beat me down, told me I, he didn't want anything part to do with Christ. And what do we say? Oh, I, I see, I, I can't be a witness. I can't do this. You know that our witness for Christ, being consumed with Christ, is a team effort. Some people are going to sow. Some people are going to reap. And the bottom line is, in the end... Christ is glorified <laughs> because lives get changed only when we all do our parts and we'll all rejoice together in the end. And then finally, again, I'm, I'm hurrying. We'll look down to verse 39. It says, Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the lady, which test, of the woman which testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days, and many more believed because of his word. You realize when you become consumed with Christ, you will find it's contagious to others. We've been talking a lot about what's contagious in our, in our world today. We're always worried about what's being, what germs are being you know, propagated here and there. We wouldn't be in a parking lot today if it wasn't for that. <laughs> but you know, when you're consumed with Christ, when Christ is your all in all, when as we just heard in the song, I surrender all, if you all of your life before Christ and people see that in you, do you know what? You're going to infect those around you <laughs> with that same contagion. Now, it's not a virus that's going to kill you. No, it's a truth. It's a hope. It's a seed that's going to be planted in you that's going to make you more alive. This is what's happened with the lady. She went to the city. Many people believed because of her. Jesus came there. Many people became, believed because of him. Do you realize the multiplication that's happening? <laughs> All of a sudden, one person consumed with Christ infects others. They become consumed with Christ. They are to infect others. This is what we are to be as Christians. We are carrying some truth <laughs> that needs to lodge not just in our hearts, but into the hearts of those around us. We need to show others what a life consumed by Christ really looks like. And when they see that in us, they will want it for themselves. Jesus Christ must be glorified. 
So as we think about this this morning, I hope whether you're a graduate or whether you've graduated long ago, <laughs> that maybe we can all be challenged by this story this morning. It doesn't matter how far down the road of life you've gone. It doesn't matter what paths you've chosen that may have put you in the wrong state of affairs. If this woman from Samaria can have her life changed by Christ and can affect an entire city because of her testimony, what can we do? What can that same Christ at work in us do through us? People will marvel at the encounters that we'll have. Our other needs, our other priorities will become secondary. Our testimony will draw other people to Christ. We'll find that the work for the Lord will satisfy us in greater and deeper ways. We'll see an urgency when we speak to those around us. We will see this as a team effort. And then we will begin to see our neighbors, our friends, our state, our county, and our nation. We'll see that fire grow. We'll see that others get consumed with Christ as well. And then Christ will be glorified. That's what we want today. We want to see Christ glorified. Let's first glorify him in our own lives. Let's have a word of prayer as we close. Lord, I do thank you that you still are in the business of changing lives. Maybe there's someone here this morning who would say, you know, Maybe I'm new, maybe I'm a recent graduate, or maybe I've been graduated long ago and I feel like maybe my paths are set. Maybe they've become deep ruts in my life. Lord, don't let those ruts define us. May we be defined by our all-consuming purpose that you've given us. If you know Christ as your Savior this morning, Lord, I pray that you would convict those here Show us where we need to be more fully consumed by Christ, more fully surrendered to Him. And may we leave today and go out this week with a new hunger and a new outlook and a new desire to serve you in greater and, 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 and deeper ways. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.